Coming on this stage. This Thank you for right a great there. year. Hell Thank of a you. drummer, hell of a bongo player, Jeffrey Paris, everybody. Osmodeus, 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 Yeah. I really, I gotta give, that's a great, that's a great actor intro song for him. Yeah. And I gotta tip my cap to Norton, man. You have that like 80s drum thing going on back there. That you were in the pocket on that thing. Well done. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, our next guest is without a doubt, our very next guest. Yep. Put your hands together, please. For Mr. Misha Collins. He's our angel. Come and save me tonight. He's our angel. All right. <laughs> I like that jacket a lot. Thanks, I like your jacket. 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 Nice jacket. Wow. Um, I did. We, we, I did. Yes. I'm pretty, I'm pretty high. <laughs> we, we just took ecstasy, so we're a little handsy. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, 50 minutes of Rob and Misha rubbing each other. You're welcome. <laughs> there he is, Misha Collins, everybody. Excuse me, I'm sorry, excuse me. Hi, guys. Oh, you are. That was a near fatal sit down. How is everyone? Very lovely here in Florida. I went on a little bike ride on the beach this morning. It was warm. I lost my AirPods. <laughs> Just one. I got the new AirPods that are like, they're new at noise canceling. And I was riding my bike and listening to a podcast. And I was like, this is great. And then I was riding, and I was like, why'd that podcast? <laughs> ah! And then I rode, tried to ride back on the beach looking for one lonely sand-covered AirPod. But the gulls had gotten it already. Um, well... Who said that? <laughs> Hi. Hi, doll. Um, uh, well, should we just jump right into questions, or should I start with answers? <laughs> answers. <clears throat> There's a book. There's a book, a cookbook. Yep, that's true. That's not a... That's a... I guess that's a... There is a book. That's an answer. Okay. It's a statement, maybe. Mm. There is a book, but that's a book. That's a statement itself. Um, the answer would be um, because my children were driving me crazy. <laughs> the book has the book has helped and hindered. I would say both. Yeah. Um, I, I wrote about this recently, but I'll, I'll share it. So the kids have, have developed a sense of ownership in the kitchen. They now feel like they are cooks. And they know what they're doing. And they all bake cakes. They did a seven-layer cake. And it was hard as rocks. <laughs> and they could, they seem, 
unable to discern that this was not the texture that we're accustomed to. They're like, this is great, isn't it? You know, with a chisel. Trying to <clears throat> but uh, recently, so speaking of hindering it as well as helping, recently um, I had been shooting late and one of the kids had kept Vicky up late or, or in the, woke her up in the middle of the night. We were both very tired. And morning, that dreaded period of day had come. And I didn't want to get out of bed, and Vicky didn't want to get out of bed, but the kids were like, we're hungry, can you make us breakfast? And I said, can you make your own breakfast? And they said, but we want waffles. And I said, can you make your own waffles? <laughs> you know how to do it. You take out the waffle iron, you plug it in, you make the batter, you can do it, right? And they're like, okay. And Vicky said, scream if anything goes wrong. <laughs> and then we fell back to sleep and, and we, of course, heard screaming. <laughs> and I ran downstairs and Mason had the batter, uh, we have a, a sort of galley kitchen. So on one counter was the plugged in hot uh, waffle iron and on the other counter opposite that, and I don't know why not next to each other, but on the other counter ha across the kitchen was the batter. And she had fallen and hurt herself because when she spread the olive oil all over the floor <laughs> to make it, <laughs> to make her go faster while she was rollerblading while she was making the waffles. <laughs> Sorry, roller skating. I want to get my facts straight. She was roller skating and, and, and felt like she could make it go faster if she put olive oil all over the floor. And then that didn't end how she thought it would end. And that's why she was screaming. And that's the kind of thing that as a parent, when you release your children who have confidence, newfound confidence into the kitchen, that's bad. That's, that's a bad thing that happens because of them being confident cooks. They think, I've got this. In fact, I can increase efficiency <laughs> by putting on my rollerblades and greasing the floor. Roller skates. Damn it. Um, thanks for fact checking me. Um, so yeah, so that kind of thing happens. And that's the kind of thing that you as a parent, you're like, OK. They know, they've been told repeatedly, don't touch the hot waffle iron. They know where the, where the mix is. It should work out. But you forget, as a parent, about the olive oil and the, the roller skates. <laughs> I'm looking for eye contact. Hi. Um, if you could pick one other character to be on the show, who would you be and why? <clears throat> if I could pick another character to, to be on the show other than Castiel? Yes. Um, I I think I might like to be, I, I might like to play Jack. Because Jack is basically Castiel, but 20 years younger. <laughs> and, and, uh, I think we, I think we need to move you to the back of the room. You go sit back there and think about what you just said. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, Misha. So I know you've been touring for the cookbook. And I was wait, wait, what happened? You've been book touring with the cookbook. Uh huh. And I was wondering what that's been like and what it's been like touring with Vicky. What was the first thing you said for some reason? I can't. No, that's the second thing. I think I, think I said, hi, Misha. <laughs> That's what I was missing. Um, <laughs> it's been good touring with Vicky. Um, we've done several signings together, and it's signing for me feels like something I have done before, um, and sh and it's new to her, and she doesn't really like being in the limelight, and and all of the attention makes her a little uncomfortable. Um, but I I had to give her some feedback doing the autographs. Um, <laughs> first of all, I have to say, so, and please don't tell her I told you this. No, and I'm sure it's not being filmed. So, so Vicky 
uh, wrote a, a book, her first book, was a on a different topic. It was not about family, <laughs> family cooking. Um, it involved multiple people, but not <laughs> families. It, um, my wife wrote a book called The Threesome Handbook. And it was, a, I don't know how long ago, but a long time ago. And when she wrote it, I was like, oh, I don't know that this is how I want to be known in the world. Like, <laughs> is the, do you need to put, can, uh, have you heard of a nom de plume? Uh, a pseudonym? Can you, can you use a different name? And she was like, no, it's a point of integrity. I am not, I'm going to use my real name. And we had a conversation and... I was like, okay, if it's that important to you, use your real name. I'll forever be marred as a pervert. But um, <laughs> now I don't care anymore. I'm like, uh, yeah, you know, hey, yeah. <laughs> kind of proud. I'm kind of proud. Um, but she, as like the mother of small children who goes to you know school functions and is trying to. Um, establish herself as, you know, an artist and a cookbook author, is trying to distance herself from herself. <laughs> and so she's using the name Vicki Collins as the author of the cookbook. Can't believe I'm, I'm revealing all of this. This is, I think this was a family secret. Um, I know you'll keep this between us. Um, so anyway, she's going by Vicki Collins. And... Uh, and I'm just so, oh, um, but she also ha has no history of signing the name Vicki Collins. And so we sat down at our first signing and she was like, oh shit, I don't have a signature. I'm signing, but I don't, I've never signed this name before, which by the way, my, uh, my legal name is Dimitri Krushnik. And when I was signing things, you know, in my earlier life, it was, I was always signing you know, like credit card receipts with that name. So I had a signature for that name. But when I came to my, my first convention, I was like, oh, I don't have a signature from this other name. But I had this, I was, uh, people did not want me to sign Dimitri Krushnik. So uh, there was a little learning curve on my signature. And if you have like one of my first autographs from one of the first conventions, it looks like a six-year-old was just like <laughs> trying to learn how to write in cursive for the first time. <laughs> Anyway, I told her I don't think she has a very good signature. Just had to, I had to, I had to be, you know, honest about it. Um, and then I had to also give her some feedback because people were coming up in the line, you know, people who had waited outside, potentially in, in a couple of spots, like in the cold, for an hour or more. And she, as they were coming up through the line, she was like looking at them and making eye contact and listening to what they said to her and responding and being genuinely like sweet and connected. And I was like, babe, you can't do that shit. That's not the kind of operation we're running here. They're gonna walk away from this table feeling like human beings. Anyway, I'm still working on her about that but it's been frustrating. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I was just wondering if you remember anything, something funny no. that you... <laughs> Sadly. It's okay, I don't either. Um, but just something funny you remember saying or doing when you were a kid. Oh. Something funny I remember doing. Well, I, I, have a, I have more than one memory of my childhood, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> one thing I remember is I remember having broken something and then telling all of the grown-ups, I must have been four, that the elves had done it. <laughs> and I distinctly remember um, deleting it. Like lying was something that was so, um, it was so different then. Um, because I, I could, if I, if I said it, I believed it. 
now, unfortunately, I know that I'm lying when I'm lying. And it makes your delivery much less believable. But I believed it so fervently that I think that I convinced the adults that the... Uh, um, I, um, I remember <clears throat> we lived on a river and we had a dog that liked to fetch sticks named Bear. And we would throw sticks into the river. He'd run out, grab the stick and bring it back. And he loved it, and we loved it, and we'd do that for hours. I was probably, this is right around probably four years old, too. And I threw the stick in the river. Bear jumped into the water, went out, grabbed the stick, and then as he reemerged on the shore, he morphed into a giant big bird <laughs> from Sesame Street. But he was a black lab, so sh this, this big bird was a giant black big bird, too. And I was scared to death because my dog had just turned into big bird. And... I was terrified, like we, uh, my mom used to make me go feed the dog downstairs, and I was like, I don't want to go feed the dog, because I never knew, like, is he going to turn into Big Bird again? <laughs> he, he eventually turned back into Bear, not when I was watching him at another, you know, but like the next day, I was like, all right, he's, he's a dog again, but I was always on edge, like, is he going to turn into Big Bird again? And then, um, I think I was probably eight and I was telling some of my new classmates, like, yeah, you know, my dog sometimes turns into Big Bird. <laughs> and as I said it, I was like, something's weird about that story. <laughs> and then I finally figured out, he, literally after having told all the kids I knew for years that this had happened, um, that I had dreamed it and believed the dream to be real, and, I, and also, like, wondered in my early childhood why I'd made no friends. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> For some reason, I've been reflecting on my, I guess, you know, writing a cookbook and thinking about, and, and having little kids, uh, but I've been reflecting on my own childhood a fair amount lately. And I, I noticed this weird thing. This is so, so boring to convey, but that I feel like I had the same mind when I was six years old as I do now. Like, the same inner kind of inner monologue and the same kind of reflection, um, like that same voice feels consistent throughout my life. Um, and I remember, you know, like, yeah, I just remember the, the way I was, like, thinking about things feels very similar to the way, like, I haven't evolved at all. Um, but it's funny because I, like, I have these very sort of almost grown-up sounding thoughts like about my place in the world and, and things like that when I was in second grade. And at the same time, I was you know, thinking much like I think now, but at the same time, I was also like when another kid was at the drinking fountain, I'd slam his face down into it. <laughs> and I've lost that, and I'm sad about that. <laughs> but I can't reconcile the fact that I was having like these very sort of contemplative thoughts, but I was also like trying to knock people's teeth out at the same time. Um, but that, that I was straying a bit from your question and I apologize. Hi. Hi. Um, I okay. guess aside Let's see how from this your goes. cookbook, what's your favorite book and like what genre do you lean, do you lean towards? What genre do I lean toward? Yeah, like comedy. I don't know. <laughs> Comedy. Drama, documentary. What are my other choices? <laughs> Did you just say documentary? I don't know. Really is, that a, is that a type? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm behind the times. I don't know what the kids are reading these days. Yeah. Um, I love reading soap operas. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, yeah. I, um, I have a few few uh, books that I have like been saying are my favorite books for a while now, and I feel like I need to re refresh. Um, there's a, there's a book that I really loved uh, that I read several years ago called Annals of the Former World by John McPhee. I don't recommend anyone else read it. It's you read it? Oh yes, you yes. I I recognize you now. Um, <clears throat> It's a, a tome. It's a tiny print. It's 600 very large, very small print. It's not big print. Um, and it's about geology. 
So it's a real page turner, people. <laughs> the reason I like that book is because um, I used to have this thing when I would get sad, like when I was in high school or something, and feel like things weren't going well. If I looked at the stars, it made me think of how infinitesimally small I am and insignificant, and somehow that was a source of comfort to me, like knowing how small I am in the universe, then I could feel like my problems had to also be proportionately pretty small. And, and then reading that book, um, it's about, it's really a, largely about time and the vast expanse of time that came before us. If you, if you stretch out your arms like this, and then you do a single medium pressure stroke with a nail file on the tip of one of your fingernails. Um, that represents, in, if, if this is the history of the earth and the timeline, that stroke is all of human existence. Like the amount of material that is taken off of your fingernail is all of human existence. So that weirdly also makes me feel good. So I, I took comfort in, in this uh, book of geology. Um, and then there's another book that I recommended <clears throat> uh, to Jared to read. He's like, it's, it's a good book to read. And I said, oh, you should read um, uh, The Life and Times of Michael Kay, as I found it incredibly uplifting. And it's about this, uh, it's, a, it's by this uh, South African writer, Coetzee, um, who writes about a man who is deeply, deeply impoverished, who has nothing um, and is forced out of the city and he ends up going, wandering off into the bush and, and living in a crack between rocks with just a few pumps. desperately hopes will one day grow into a pumpkin. And then ultimately soldiers come and destroy his pumpkins. And I found this incredibly uplifting. <laughs> Which, because like somehow through this, he still maintained a shred of humanity and happiness. And... So to me, through the lens of my optimistic mind, I saw like this was an uplifting story. Jared read it and he was like, it's the most depressing thing I've ever <laughs> read. Um, so there are a couple of rec recommendations. Another book that I just read that's also good is um, Educated by Tara Westover. It's amazing. It's a memoir about a woman who's uh, you know, kept cloistered by her very religious zealot family. Um, and she's not allowed to go to school and not allowed to watch TV. It doesn't, she goes, she ends up like getting herself to college, but she's never been to school. And she goes and in, and in one of her first classes, they say, they're talking about, it's a history class. And they talk about, they're talking about the Holocaust. And she's like, what's the Holocaust? And everyone thought that she was like, you know, somebody uh, like a, a Holocaust denier and that she was trying to act like it never happened, but she literally had been so isolated that she didn't, she'd never heard of it before. And she was genuinely curious, like, what is this thing that you're talking about? Um, anyway, it's a really interesting memoir, very well written. So I, I'm on a weird, like, you wind me up and I just don't stop talking. <laughs> and I can tell you're all bored and I'm still talking, <laughs> sorry. Hi. All right, so you know that we like you, but we adore Vicky. Um, we tolerate you. Yeah, but that's you. because she's <laughs> undermining me at the autograph line. What does she... I, keep, I kept having to look over. I was like, don't fucking look at them in the eye. <laughs> You're making me look bad. How does she feel about all the love that has been shown to her? The love that's shown to her? Oh, God. Nothing makes her more uncomfortable. <laughs> People will come up to the table when we're signing and say something complimentary to her. And you can just see her like wilting inside. She's like, oh God, stop it. I, I relish those moments. <laughs> Good talk. <clears throat> Hi, Misha. Hi. Um, my question is, if you could go back in time to when you went in for your audition for Supernatural, what would you tell yourself about your experience that you've had? If I could go back in time, um, I would say 
Um, well, one thing I would tell myself is that it's going, this is going to go on for nearly forever. <laughs> You'll be an old, weathered, wrinkled man when you're done with this show. So I think part of Part of what happened with me on Supernatural is I got into like a make hay while the sun shines mentality. Like, oh, I'm on the show, people are watching. I, I got to, you know, start a nonprofit and do all these other things and like squeeze everything in because this, you know, who knows when it's going to be gone. The tr truth is, it never. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, this has been going on forever. One thing I would say, brace yourself. Um, something terrible is going to happen in 2016. Um, Um, I would say, um, yeah, um, I think, I, I guess there's one more thing that I would say. I think that I, I maybe squandered a little bit of time. I, I would love to have known that this was going to be a long r run and not spent time, like, thinking about, oh, where is this going? What's going to happen? Because I think if I could have just, like, relaxed into embracing that early on, it would have been um, it would have been more joyful and productive overall, um, and I probably would have said you need to train yourself to not respond when someone touches your groin. <laughs> because if I had taken that away from Jared early on. He would have lost his power over me. <laughs> um. <clears throat> we have, so the camera um, on set, the, the camera is quite large, and there's something called a camera dolly, which is basically like a cart that the camera can mount to and the camera operator can sit on and then the dolly operator pushes the camera in a scene when the camera has movement. And, um, and our dolly operator, his name is Dave, he came up to me one day and he was like, Misha, uh, there's something I've been meaning to talk to you about. And I said, oh, okay. And he was very serious and it sounded like maybe I had done something horrible. And he said, this is a trick that I learned a long time ago, but if when you're trying not to laugh, you should try to imagine, think about how much you hate the other people who are trying to make you laugh. And so, if you watch any given episode of Supernatural, <laughs> what you will see is, it, what it appears to be is Castiel interacting with Sam and Dean in a scene, but really what you're seeing is Misha thinking, I hate you, Jensen. I hate you, Jared. In a desperate effort not to laugh when my balls are being fondled. Hi, Misha. Hi. So when we first meet Cass, he's very much a soldier on a mission. He's evolved a lot over time, and then in season 14, briefly, we got to see a version of Cass who I believe didn't even know who Sam and Dean were in the 300th episode, Lebanon, when he comes back with Zachariah. So I wanted to know what it was. Thank you for filling that in, because I, I did a little research before <laughs> I asked the question. <laughs> but I wanted to know what it was like getting to play that version of Cass who was more like the original Cass. <clears throat> well, Cass, there wasn't a lot of Cass in that episode. Um, so I didn't get to really dig into the character much, but it was kind of an interesting exercise for me because I remember very distinctly, like, I was like, what the hell was Cass like back then? And it, it kind of came back, you know, except for I look 15 years older, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, but yeah, there were certain, and, and it's fun, funny because it's something that I just haven't thought about a lot. You know, like what was the original cast like compared to the cast as he, you know, uh, compared to cast as he presents now? But you know, there were just little things. He was very, he was much more robot, robotic, and, and obedient, and much angrier. Um, 
he's got much more contemplative as time has gone on. Uh, he doesn't head tilt quite as much. Um, and he doesn't fight as well as he used to. It's true, isn't it? Yeah. It was good. Hi. Hi, Misha. Um, I was wondering if you, Misha, were to ever meet Castiel, how do you think that interaction would go? Um, I think it would go remarkably well. Um, I think it would go a lot like this, like, well, you're very handsome. <laughs> you're, you're very handsome as well, thank you. And that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I would say, ah, oh, you look taller in person. <laughs> That's been a great source of frustration to me over the years, since we're bearing it all today. <laughs> Normally in television, I remember when I was working on Charmed, and, and I, was, uh, I was a child. And, but I was working with Alyssa Milano and Shannon Doherty, and I, I uh, the director kept telling me to stand up because when I was talking to them, I was like <laughs> bending down to their level to talk to them because I was a giant compared to them. I mean, people in television tend to be really small. And then I got onto the set of Supernatural. <laughs> and... You know, they early on both had um, extensions to their leg bones, <laughs> surgically implanted. And, <laughs> and I have to go like this when I'm talking. And, and for some reason, it also, I distinctly remember it like in, the, in season four and five, it seemed like it, whenever we were like outside or something and on a hill, it would be like, okay, Jared, you stand here, and Misha, you stand down there. <laughs> and I'd be like, <laughs> I felt like I was always like trying to act from the bottom of, and um, yeah, yeah. So it, it's been strange being on on Supernatural for that reason. But whenever I come to conventions and people come up to the photos, then they're like, "Oh, they see that I'm not a." They everyone watching television obviously thinks I'm a dwarf, <laughs> <laughs> and then they're like, "Oh, you're near normal height." It's really hi. Oh, Sorry, that no. was unceremonious. Goodbye. <laughs> and that was rude of me. I apologize. Hello. It's okay. Um, uh, uh, Did you lose your train of thought when I interrupted yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So we um, know that Dean and Kaz are like uh, uh, separated. Or, um, they're like mad at each other right now. And they, it's a trial separation. So I was just wondering if you ever think that Cass, or no, I'm, oh God. You're doing, I was going to say you're doing great. You're not doing great, but oh my God. I, I, I don't want to give, I don't want to give false encouragement, but you are doing this. I can say that. It's moving forward. You started and, and some of the question has come out and that's an achievement. We can celebrate. Let's celebrate that victory. And. <laughs> And who knows, we might even get more of the question. <laughs> um, I am wondering yes. if you ever think that Dean and Cass are going to have that profound bond that they had when Cass first started on the show. You mean, are they going to get back together? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say that. What are you going to get? <laughs> I'm asking if they would ever have the profound bond. Is that, that they... a euphemism? No! <laughs> are you... <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. What's that? You know what I'm talking about. I know what you're talking about? Oh, so it's innuendo. <laughs> What do you think? Um, <laughs> what do I think? Yeah. Uh, I think Dean's 
been too mean, so I don't think Cash should, you know, have that profound bond again. I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to do that. So you think Cass should ice him out a little bit? <laughs> Play hard to get? Yes. Okay, you said it, not me. Um, <laughs> actually, technically, I said it. Um, so, uh, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, <clears throat> I think there will be, between the I mean, I'm going to get in so much trouble. Um, shame on you. I can't believe you brought that up. <clears throat> Impala. Actually, it's, it's a safe phrase. Get out of my trunk, we say. Um. Hi, Misha. Question is, of all the 11 years... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. These people were... Hi. Hi. Um, of all the 11 years that Cassiel has been on the show, what do you think his most defining moment has been? It's 12, <laughs> te technically. What was his what was his biggest moment? Defining moment? Well. Um <laughs> it's not bad. Um, <laughs> um <clears throat> I think it's probably when Cass became human and tried to eat a tube of toothpaste. <laughs> I think that encapsulates the character perfectly. Um, I can't think of a better example. <laughs> Someone yelled uh, up, up front, um, I, I was contemplating taking credit for it, but other people might have heard it, and then I, they would not. So I'm going to give you credit, sir. He said, hey, ass butt. <laughs> and that actually, that actually might might define be Cass's defining moment because what it shows is like he's a he's a team player he's he's out you know he's out to fight the good fight and he is a warrior and he's just a little off <laughs> like ass butt is not something that people say to each other when they're trying to insult them it's just a little off it was perfect for Cass yeah, anyone else, and everyone would have been like, oh, dude, you're killing the heroic moment here. But everyone's like, yeah, that's Cass, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I remember when I was a kid, I was in, at a new school, and I was getting picked on, bullied by this kid named Jake, and we were, we were playing dodgeball, and another kid held my arms, and Jake threw the ball into my face, and then everyone was laughing at me, and then I was crying, and I was nine, and I, and I stood up and I said, drop dead, you, 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 Jake, you. <laughs> it was so awful. <laughs> I just couldn't think of an insult. And I feel like that's Cass. He's like, hey, ass butt. <laughs> anyway, hi. Hello. Um, I have a question for a friend who couldn't be here. Sure. Um, and he wants to know, uh, why is Cass ignoring Sam when he and Dean are the ones who are, like, fighting? 
Whoa. You're getting into the whole triangle. Um, I, think, um, I think he knows that they're together. Uh, that Sam and Dean are, I don't know. I have no idea. Writer forgot that he was who he was fighting with? Probably. Writers mix up the brothers all the time. It's like they could interchange their dialogue, you know. I think that it'd be, most of the scripts might be generated by robots now, anyway. <laughs> I'm just kidding, dear writers and producers. I, I know that's not the case. Um, good question. Very, very probing. Why, why did you ask that? Or why did your friend want to know that? Um, I think because he really likes Sam, he doesn't want you to be mad at him. <laughs> oh, well, that's sweet. That's a really good reason. I appreciate that. Um, I'm not. I'm not neither. Well, okay. I'm not. Sorry. Castiel is not mad at Sam. You know, Jared, another story. But, <laughs> um, okay. Thanks for, thanks for asking that. I don't have a satisfactory answer for you. But that's what you get. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Hi. Hey, Misha. Um, so people have asked before, like, what you think your ending for your character could be, and I think people have given like realistic canon type answers. But now with like this theme of like, what do you what do you think would be an ultimate um, happy ending for Cass? You know, like everybody. <laughs> It is so hard for me to take the high road. <laughs> okay, so what, what would be the ultimate happy what ending for Cass? What would be a happy, everybody wins, you know, like, um, you know, everybody wins, everybody lives kind of a ending? Or what would be the worst case scenario ending? Well, actually both. What, what would be the happy ending what, and what would be the worst case scenario ending? Okay, Cass. well, worst case scenario is no happy ending. <laughs> but you thought getting a happy ending. <laughs> Um, I've never felt more juvenile. I, I, um, I think that, <clears throat> I actually think that a happy ending, <laughs> um, where everybody just feels like, oh, that was great, there was a you know, full release, that, that we, <laughs> that we, um, I just, I feel like that would be great. And the, and the audience could be like, ah, oh, that was, you know, that was $20 well spent. And, <laughs> sorry, 20 episodes uh, well watched. And um, I think that, I think that there, I actually, we know, this is hard for me to answer because we know what the last scene of Supernatural is going to be. And because you all have been so nice, I'll tell you exactly what it is. What is wrong with you? Shame on you. Um, but I have to say, I actually really am happy knowing that I know the ending. Um, it's, it's kind of cool because we're, we're, we're working towards something and we know what, what it is that we're working toward. And the last, the, the end of the show is going to be both a happy ending and a sad ending. Um, it's going to be, I think, kind of a combination of those two endings that you're looking for. And it's going to be, um, I think it's going to be satisfying. Um, <laughs> it's just, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit here. <laughs> um, it'll be, yeah, you know, it'll, it'll, uh, 
it'll make uh, some people will cry. Um, you've been crying already. Well, this will be one of those those crying moments, um, but it'll also have. Uh, I saw what this. Where I heard what the final scene is going to be. I was like, oh, that's actually happier than I thought it would be. Um, and yet there's, there's, uh, but you will be crying too. Happy and sad at the same time. How's that? Was that okay for everybody? Very good. Not really at all spoilery, just talking about happy and sad. Um, thank you. Oh, hi. <clears throat> hi. Um, Supernatural has become such a source of strength and inspiration and comfort for so many people. What advice do you have for the fandom to help us begin to emotionally cope with the show coming to an end? Um, yeah, I don't have any. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll give some advice. Um, I think that one of the... So, yes, um, this... this show, for... Mul no. For, multi for multitudinous reasons, this show has become a source of inspiration and support for a lot of the members of the fandom. And I'm trying to talk now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and part of that is that this show deals with deep mythological storylines that resonate with everyone. Um, and serve as, you know, the there's a reason that humans tell stories. It's to inspire and instruct new generations and to pass on, you know, pass on the culture that is important to us, right? And so the mythology embedded within Supernatural is something that inspires people. I, I was talking to someone earlier today who said that she joined the, the military because Supernatural had inspired her to want to be of service in the, in the biggest way she could. And I thought that was really beautiful. And it's easy for us to go to work and sort of punch the clock and forget that that's a, that's a part of what's going on here and that's important. I think also the fact that we, that the show has been on for so long and, and the audience has gotten to watch Sam and Dean go from being boys to being decrepit old men. <laughs> also, weirdly, makes them feel like a part, that makes Sam and Dean feel like a part of the audience's family. Like you've watched these guys grow up. And so there's gonna be some real mourning when they're gone, just like you, like you would mourn someone in years um, who, who is dead and gone. Um, but there's another aspect, I think, to what, why Supernatural has been a source of, of strength and inspiration to fans, and that's that this community that has coalesced around the show has been incredibly supportive. Like, people find support in one another. So many stories about Supernatural fans reaching out and supporting people who are in the fandom who are having a hard time. And being a source of comfort and community to one another. And I would say, like, keep doing that. This community doesn't have to go away just because the show goes away. You guys can, you can form profound bonds. Hi, Misha. Hi. Um, so one of my favorite cast storylines was um, his relationship with Claire. Um, couple of, w couple wait, of relationship ago. with what? Claire. Uh-huh. Um, and since uh, those episodes, she's taken on her own life in the show, but we haven't actually seen Cass with Claire at all. Um, so my question, sorry, I can't, it's a little high up. Um, <laughs> my question is, do you think they still maintain any kind of relationship? And given it's the last season, they're shelling out all the money to bring everybody back. Um, uh, do you think... <laughs>
sorry. I'm now swiping at phantom objects in the air. <clears throat> um, Do you, are you asking if we could ever conceivably afford Catherine Newton again? Well, yes, and what would, what no. is, what would that look like? <laughs> She's too much of a movie star now. I mean, I, I, it would be awesome to have uh, Catherine back and, and see Claire again. I don't know. Um, I've only seen scripts up, you know, up through 14. Um, so I don't know whether, whether we will see her again or whether that's something that's under discussion. Um, I will tell you that the character of Claire is talking about Claire again soon. And she is folded into the storyline, although not on screen. And that's all I'm going to tell you. I probably shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> Forget that I said that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you're back in my good graces. We're getting along again. Oh, sorry, you're not. Somebody else is. Um, <laughs> Hi. Hi. Okay, so my question is, on behalf of my friend, what is the most significant moment in your life? I'd probably say conception. <laughs> I really feel like everything unfolded from that point. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Nisha. Um, so I was wondering, I was super stoked when your cookbook came out because I love to bake and I love to cook. I love to be in the kitchen. So what would be... What's your favorite recipe out of the cookbook, and what would you think would be a good recipe to start with? Um, what is my favorite recipe? Well, um, I should have a ready answer for that question. Um, I like the, I have always <clears throat> been somebody who t takes great comfort in breakfast foods for some reason. Like when I had a lot of time on my hands and I uh, wasn't working, I would always go to diners for breakfast. That was just like my happy place. And my favorite breakfast item, which, which I have to say, I think I probably make the best egg and cheese sandwich you will ever meet. Um, but we modified the egg and cheese sandwich to, uh, challenge accepted? Who said? <laughs> Why, what's so great about your egg and cheese? Sandwich. <laughs> okay, the throwdown. <laughs> we have egg and cheese muffins. So the kids, like we use muffin tins and then you cut little rounds and the kids can make these like little egg and cheese muffins and then you bake them in the oven and they come out great and they're cute and fun and the kids love making them. So that's probably one of my favorite uh, uh, recipes in the cookbook. There's another one that was... Um, that is shepherd's pie. And for some reason, when I was sick and I was a kid and I wanted to something comforting, I would always ask for shepherd's pie. And so I guess that one just has like a, a sense memory soft spot in my heart. Um, and then there's another, there's another recipe. So the cookbook has, basically it's designed to encourage kids trying new foods and eating healthy foods, but also uh, uh, it's also designed to help the family bond around the process of cooking and eating. And, uh, and one of the things that we've done through in that process is like given, sometimes given the kids license to invent new things or, or take control of the cooking process. And sometimes um, we'll wake up in the morning and I'll say something like, okay guys, why don't you try to invent a breakfast that nobody else has ever made before? And then, then they're like, all right, let's do it. And one morning, Mason was like, let's do breakfast popsicles. And, and she was just so, like, excited about it. And I, I was like, yes, let's do that. We have orange juice. We have other fruit in the, in the kitchen. Let's make breakfast popsicles. And she's like, yes. And we have scrambled eggs and bacon <laughs> and toast and all of that went in a blender, and then it went into the freezer in the, in the popsicle mold. And then it came, unfortunately, came out of the freezer. <laughs> and I had to eat a breakfast popsicle. It was awful. <laughs> and so 
that is a, an example recipe in the cookbook. There are, I think, like five of the, those kind of recipes that are like sort of showing how creativity can w run wild. And there's a little caveat, like, please don't actually ever cook this. <laughs> um, but the kids thought they were delicious. And that was sort of a part of the point, was that they, they'll eat anything if they feel like it's theirs and they're proud of it. Um, but we had an argument about that when we were talking about which recipes to include in the book. And I said, let's not, let's go ahead and leave that one out because it's, this is a cookbook and you want people to like food and that, that's a recipe that's gonna make people never wanna eat again. <laughs> it's vile and it's definitely not appetizing. And, uh, but Vicky was like, no, we, we should really include it. And then we sent, and so once again, she won the argument. We sent the draft off to the publisher. all week and I feel like it really illustrates the point that if kids you know take ownership of a recipe that they'll eat anything and I think we should put it back in and Vicky was like told you and so it's in there but it's also uh, it's a recipe that has driven a wedge in my marriage okay hi hi Misha well my original question was taken and you answered it so oh, uh, um, <laughs> that's okay. what was it what your favorite was because I I just purchased the cookbook and I wanted to know because I don't you know oh okay I want to I'm anxious to go home and make I, know, I, and I, I answered it and then I went on a tangent but I but, but I have a new one okay um, with all the recipes besides the creations of your kids coming up with new inventions to put in there what kinds of recipes are they? Or are they ones that you guys like? They're handed down from family or between the two families, yours and Vicky's, or what? We don't like any of the stuff in the cookbook. I didn't think you did. <laughs> no. Uh, and, they're all, and all the recipes are just stolen from other cookbooks. <laughs> so what we did is we just sat down, we got a bunch of cookbooks, and we sat down at the table and we flipped through and we're like, oh, that doesn't look very good. Let's put that in our book. Until, and we were actually just tearing pages out of other cookbooks, until the stack of pages was about the height of a cookbook. And then we, you know, hand wrote it so it looked like it was done by us on other paper, and then mailed it into Harper's. Okay. <laughs> so that's what the process of writing the cookbook was. Is that helpful? That makes me real excited that I just purchased it from. <laughs> <laughs> Do you li <laughs> like any of the stuff? Like, is it stuff that is good or gross? Like, what is the, it is, I guess, in fairness, it really is a mashup of good and gross. Um, but you you read it and you tell me what you think and, and we can discuss it further okay. later, okay? Okay. Okay, thanks. Hi, Misha. Sorry, I brought up another story that just happened. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, so there's a passage in the book that's about, um, about one of the things the book is trying to do is help parents ingratiate uh, their kids to new foods and explore the panoply of, of different options of food there are out in the world. And there's a story about a parent sort of scrunching her face up at dried seaweed that her daughter was about to try. Um, and being like, oh, I, d I don't like that. I, I, I find it very fishy, the mom said. And, and then the kid who was about to try this new food was like, oh, yeah, okay, I'm not going to try that. And so it, it, was a, it was in there to illustrate how, like, if we, you know, if we broadcast our own biases about food, then our kids are just going to pick up on them. And the mom who had said that got a copy of the book and immediately identified herself. She was like, she texted Vicky and was like, that, that was me that you were talking about there, wasn't it? And Vicky was like, oh God, I didn't think that you were gonna put two, and it was years ago and I didn't, you know, it was like this awkward thing. Mom felt terrible and the mom took her seven-year-old to the grocery store. And the grocery store they had, they were doing a bunch of free samples in the aisles. This was two nights ago. And, and the mom was like, well, I am not going to be that mother anymore. And, 
they had free samples of hazelnuts. And the mom was like, Jane, change the name to protect the innocent. Jane, you want to try this? Whereas previously, she would have been like, you don't like those. Gave Jane the, um, the hazelnut. And then uh, they had to take Jane by ambulance <laughs> to the hospital <laughs> because of the anaphylactic shock that she went into. Jane's OK. We've been talking to them. But she also said, I knew <laughs> I knew I shouldn't have her try new things. <laughs> It was really, that whole really backfired. Um, <laughs> terrible. We felt terrible. Um, but that doesn't happen often. <laughs> OK. Is it your turn? Whose turn is it? Your turn. I'm sorry. Hi. Sorry. Hi. Um, so I've got a bit of a random question. OK. Um, so basically, what's your favorite word or phrase? What's my favorite word yeah, or phrase? Yeah, just, just ones that you sort of, you know, when you use them, you just think, oh, I like that one, or just oh, yeah, things yeah. like that. I guess it's a phrase, um, and I, it's one that I use on set a lot. Uh, please don't touch me there. <laughs> yes. Um, since it's the holiday season, and what was a family tradition that you used to celebrate as a kid that you've kind of used as something to celebrate with your kids now? Um, we had a, uh, a holiday. Well, one, one thing that we have done a fair amount that I really love is going, like, on Thanksgiving, we have uh, tried to, like, go bring food to homeless shelters or actually go bring, like, prepared plates of food to homeless people that we can find just around town. We, we did that when we were in LA all the time. Um, another holiday tradition uh, in my family was uh, we would make gingerbread villages and they would have themes over um, like Christmas and New Year's. Eight sheet of plywood and then put topography on it like hills and lakes and things like that and then have a theme and like create an entire village around a theme. And like, so one, one year, like there were railroad tracks that went through, it was a town, and it was like the good side of the tracks and the bad side of the tracks. <laughs> and we had um, that, this was, the, the year that we did this was in, uh, it was in Santa Cruz, California. And, uh, and we, um, we had like flushing toilets that were gold in like these glass-faced mansions. I mean, we really get into it. And our gingerbread village-making skills are pretty awesome. Um, and then on the other side of the tracks, it was like boarded up windows and liquor stores and, and people sleeping on benches under newspaper, on benches under, under newspapers and like someone with a syringe stuck in their arm. <laughs> Classy stuff, right? And we finished it and it took up the whole kitchen table and then we we're like, what are we going to do with this? And we were kind of proud of this one. And so Vicky's sister, who lived, was the one that lived in, in Santa Cruz, was like, you know what? Why don't we, we would do, like, we would melt candy, different kinds of candies and chew different things up. And, like, you know, like, it was the kind of thing that you don't, like, it was a lot of, like, manipulating with our sweaty hands and to get the right textures that we wanted. Anyway, Monica said, there's a community center nearby and they have a, like a display area, I could call them and see if we could set it up in there. We called, they said, yeah, bring it down. So we brought it down, we put it in the community center, we went back the next day, and the homeless had come in and eaten the whole thing. <laughs> so gross. <laughs> I felt terrible. Um, that was, a, that was a, a family tradition, and we do that with our kids, uh, too. We make, we're still making, and it's really, Really fun, but super messy and so time consuming. Yeah. Okay, good talk. Thank you. Hi, guys. Hi, hi, how are you? Oh, shit. Hey, Mish, I didn't hi. see you there. Hey. hey. You were so this stealth is weird. stealthy getting on stage. Just yeah, now. we tried. We're trying. We're just trying not to get booed. That's really the. So we. Well, you know, you know, you have them eating out of the palm of your hand when they, when you make the joke about not getting booed and, and they boo you, you booed, for us. Yep. <laughs> By the way, just so you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe early to announce, but 
Uh, when Rob writes a book about his experience in the convention world, it will be trying not to get booed, the Rob Bittenberg story. <laughs> Fronting conventions from 2002 to 2022. <laughs> and I won't sell a copy. Um, Misha, speaking of selling copies, how's your, uh, your book going? It's cool. I think it's going great. I, I saw yeah. your post about the billboard. I thought that was really cool. That was What's the billboard? Awesome. What billboard? Yeah. There's, There's a, a billboard in L.A. Is there? Book. Yeah. Where? If, uh, in well, LA. narrow it down, Mike. It's uh, it's right there. It's why are you LA gonna drive street. around? Are you gonna drive around looking for it? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Just tell me where it is. Uh, no. Yeah, make it look. <laughs> look for it. Well, I tell you. Um, yeah. And and how 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 are album sales going? The album, th thanks to the support of the lovely people of the Supernatural fandom, the album has done very well, which is lovely. That's awesome. Yeah. We we. Yesterday, we reached uh, number five on the iTunes uh, country charts, which I thought was... Amazing. Which that's I thought was fabulous. So awesome. Yeah. Um, that's really cool. Yeah, thanks, man. Well, I mean... Guys, so you're, you're not going to have time for us anymore, are you? Yeah. Uh, I only am employed by you. I don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. I literally have no other job but <laughs> things that involve you. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> You, we, we've literally talked about me after the show ends being your valet. I'm not sure, like, <laughs> is this your way of firing me? <laughs> this got weird. Um, how was it out here, buddy? It was great. These people yeah. are... Yeah. I, there were a couple of times when I had to course correct to sort of take their minds out of the gutter. <laughs> but all in all, I think it was pretty good. Oh, good. So, well, yeah. listen. Proud of your, we're proud of your fundraising with that book. It's impressive, man. You do Thank great you. work for a lot of great people. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Misha Collins! He's our angel. Come and save me Um, well, anyway, I, well, there they go. People here do know what time it is. It's time to stampede towards the exits. So That's right. Good for you for getting the memo. Push out your buddy out of the way. Get out of my way. Time to get to the exit. Hey, you. F off. I gotta get to the exit. What you doing there, Grandma? Having a sandwich. Nobody can go to the exit. Hey, you brought your child. Too bad, I'm gonna step on her face. As we go to the exit, get the hell out of Dodge. Uh, what's the hurry? I don't know, I just see people going that way. So I jump on the bandwagon, get the hell out. Anywhere's better than this. Dude, if I see those old timers stand up and do their B level county for five more minutes, I swear to Christ, I'm gonna shoot myself right in my effing face. I got it. Which one is Rob and which one is Rich? You oh, told I don't really me care. Nobody gives They're both a kinda shit. sad. You told me 20 times they should have pictures in this program, and may we discuss this program. There are a million things listed on here in font small enough to be on a grain of rice. Are they trying to confuse us? What's the point of having a program that's unreadable? It makes me angry. And that's why, that's why I'm going to stampede to the exit. Thank you. There you go. We'll see you tonight, everybody. Everybody, see you tonight. Saturday special. There he goes. Rob Benedict, Billy Moran. <laughs> and Mike Bora. All right, folks, so if you are ready for your autograph.